Hey, this is Ari. Welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. With me today for the third time is my friend, Dr. Michael Ruscio, who is a clinical researcher and author working fervently to reform and improve the field of functional and integrated medicine. With his clinical and research teams, he scours existing studies to inform his ongoing clinical research, patient care, and guidance for health seekers and fellow clinicians around the world. His primary focus is gut health and its impact on other facets of health, including energy, sleep, mood, and thyroid function. His research has been published in peer-reviewed medical journals, and he speaks at integrated medical conferences across the world. While actively seeing patients in his clinic, he also runs an influential blog and podcast, as well as newsletter for functional medicine practitioners. And uh, this is a podcast where we talk a ton about really important aspects of gut health and probiotics in particular. Uh, there's some topics that are controversial and we have really wonderful exchanges around these. Uh, I personally really enjoyed this conversation and uh, this interview of, of Dr. Michael Ruscio. Uh, he gives a lot of value and I think you're gonna get a lot of value from this podcast. And particularly if you're a high level health science geek who's very interested in gut health, I think you're going to find this fascinating. So enjoy the episode. So welcome back to the show, Dr. Ruscio. Thanks for having me back. Always good to be here. Yes, I think this is number, it's at least number two and possibly, I think number three. Maybe three, yeah. Yeah, cool, man. So uh, let's talk about big picture, how gut health connects to the health of the rest of the body, how it connects to autoimmune disease, how it connects to inflammation, immune function, how it connects to fatigue, brain function, where, you know, there's so many different axes, right? The gut immune axis, the gut lung axis, the gut brain axis, the gut mitochondria axis. I'm sure each one of those you could talk for an hour about, but um, give us the overview of how good guts go bad. Yeah, this is a great question. And as you know, it's something I learned painfully in my early 20s where I had terrible sleep, um, almost crippling. I mean, if someone listening to this or watching this has had fairly marked insomnia, it's almost like being tortured. And so I had that along with fatigue in the day, obviously, because if you're not sleeping well at night, you're going to uh, only be able to get a couple, a couple of days in and then it just wears on your energy. And my mental clarity, of course, um, and my mood. So for me, I learned, wow, the brain is connected to the gut. And as you noted, there are so many systems that are connected. Skin conditions, various types of rashes or acne or pimples, thyroid conditions, um, immune conditions in general, joint pain, mitochondria, nutrient absorption. I mean, there, there's just so many areas that tie to the gut. Um, we can cardiovascular disease, more research uh, is, is appearing on this. There's really a, a wealth. Uh, and, and as you said, there are so many directions we go, especially if we're going to get into the kind of academic minutia. But thankfully, I think why we get along so well is as cool as the academic minutia is, I think we try to center our our focus around, well, okay, what can someone do to improve this thing and therefore have a positive impact on their health? And this is where the gut is such a cool lever that we can pull on in terms of seeing various gut interventions actually improving things like cholesterol, like for myself, brain fog and sleep, or a skin condition, or joint pain, or what have you. But to try to answer your, your question with a couple of concise responses, the largest density of immune cells in the entire body is in the small intestine. And if we understand the relationship between the immune system and inflammation, we also understand that not only autoimmunity because of the immune connection there, but also inflammation tie back to the health or lack of health in the small intestine. So that's the one. And then the one or two others to tack on behind that would be absorption of calories, but perhaps more importantly, absorption of your nutrients, right? So if you're not absorbing nutrients well, even if you're eating a healthy diet, you could be kind of pseudo malnourished because you're not getting that much out of your diet. And this isn't, 
um, this isn't highly speculative. I mean, sure, if someone has very bad, let's say, inflammatory bowel disease with 13 diarrheas per day, pretty obvious that there's going to be a degree of malabsorption. But there are even studies at the other end of the spectrum that have shown something like a probiotic can improve absorption of various micronutrients. Mm -hmm. So the inflammation, autoimmune, and nutrient absorption pieces might be three of the most upstream ways in which gut health affects all these things that we see downstream. Mm -hmm. I, I took a, a gut course recently with um, sort of a world-renowned uh, gut researcher, and I learned a ton, actually. Um, one of the interesting things that he talked about in sort of all these different lectures and all these different gut conditions, ulcerative colitis and diverticulitis and um, IBS and, you know, on and on and on a dozen different conditions. One of the things you see consistently over and over again is, um, you know, yesterday I was reading one on ulcerative colitis has increased 11 fold since the 1990s. Mm. Um, and, and you see that same sort of trend, this, every disease, almost every gut disease has increased two, three, five, tenfold in the last few decades. What, what do you see as the biggest contributing factors to why there is a need for so many gut specialists like yourself to, to, to emerge and why there's so many people talking about gut health right now? What, what has caused so many people to have gut issues now? Well, it's likely multifactorial antibiotic use, probably one, although I think it's important to clarify the antibiotics have the most deleterious effect the earlier they're administered in life. So this would be children, especially infants. When you're an adult, I think it's important to clarify that while sure, some antibiotic associated side effects are documented, they don't have the same negative impact. It's, you know, we don't want to use them willy nilly, sure. But um, just as a, you know, as a quick aside, I think it is important, almost like a uh, PSA, adults shouldn't be highly, highly trepidatious regarding any antibiotic because the adult mm -hmm. microbiota is somewhat resistant. So if you're trusting in your doctor and you think they're making the recommendation with uh, you know, a good level of circumspection, then sure, uh, as an adult. But for, for children, the early use of antibiotics is one, the lack of exposure to the environment and what I call naturally occurring or, or good dirt, kind of hunter-gatherer dirt, right? Literally being outside in the dirt, touching animals, not in a weird way, um, you know, and just, just, <laughs> just doing, doing things that would expose you to all these microbes that tune your immune system. And that's been very well documented. Maybe one of the most elegant studies looked at mothers and children and they, they mapped out on one axis the amount of autoimmune conditions they had and on the other axis, the amount of animals, farm animals they had contact with. And there was a totally inverse relationship where the more contact with animals, the lower the incidence of inflammatory and autoimmune conditions. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another big one. It's, it's harder to rectify, perhaps, you know, go live in a farm. Well, it's not like you can just easily do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but the antibiotics, the environment kind of writ large, and along with that would be our diet. Uh, this is where things get a little bit um, murky in terms of, yes, the processed food, def you know, obviously, definitely a bad thing. Do you have to go to a super high fiber diet? Maybe not, but do you need to not be on the standard American diet? Definitely. F you know, from there, if you go in any direction where you're eating less processed food, whether it's something more like a Mediterranean or a paleo or a low carb or even a vegetarian, relative to baseline, that's going to be healthier for your gut. What was the, la what was the last... Dietary pattern uh, you mentioned? Uh, ve vegetarian. Okay. I mean, I'm yeah. not a huge proponent of a vegetarian diet, but I think you can certainly make a case any diet relative to no diet, if it's if it's centered around standard processed foods, it's going to be a huge win. Mm -hmm. So I try to get too kind of caught up into the debates about the diets and yeah. kind of have this kind of meta view on them. I'll make sure to ask you a lot of questions about your diet theories yeah. and yeah. diet yeah. debates <laughs> and which dietary camps you hate. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and then lifestyle, right? We know that sleep and stress will perturb the microbiota. There's some really cool studies looking at college students pre-exam, right? As they're coming into the pre-exam stress period, and there's a skewing of the microbiota and a dwindling of healthy population. So 
once we start weaving all these things together, right, kids who also may not have been adequately breastfed, let's say, plus antibiotic use, plus lack of exposure to the environment and the natural germs and bacteria that are supposed to partially colonize and partially help tune the immune system, which by the way, that immune system tuning by the second or third year of age sets the tone of the immune system for your entire life to a greater or lesser extent, um, plus lack of sleep, plus processed foods in the diet, right? Plus minimal amount of exercise. So all these things start accruing and we have not only gut problems, but as I'm sure you've talked about a whole cascade of the problems that are associated with the Western diet and lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to the farm animal thing that you mentioned. And, uh, obviously this relates to the hygiene hypothesis. Right. Um, can, can you explain the hygiene hypothesis? Let's say people, probably a lot of people listening to this have never heard of it, or maybe have heard of it, but don't really know what it means and, and how the gut is involved in mediating that sort of immune education. Yeah, this is a great question. And I love the way you phrase that immune education. Um, you, you can think of, or one can think of the immune system and the gut as systems that require stress in order to work properly, very similar to bones, right? If we were in a, a no stress or no gravity environment, our bones would not work. And we take that for granted. Same thing happens in our gut. The immune system, it, it requires, I guess you could say hormesis or, or healthy stress in order to function. So it's easy to kind of get caught up in this, oh my God, like germs are bad, bacteria are bad, and, and want to get away from everything. But that's a baby with the bathwater kind of philosophy in the sense that, sure, being exposed to things like animals and dirt and germs does pose some risk. But along with that risk, there's a lot of benefit. And this this almost kind of breaks down to a current day, sort of like COVID, the way people think about the environment where some people want to just hide and reclude and other people want to try to be healthy. And this is kind of like the germ versus terrain theory. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not a big proponent of extremes, but you do see extremes, right? You see some people who throw caution to the wind completely. That might be a little bit too far. You see some people who you know, are triple masking and, and slathering themselves in antibacterial um, soaps and washes. Um, but the essence of that, I, I think, is important to keep in mind, which is these exposures are important. And this is why you'll, you'll maybe see some pediatricians who say if you drop the pacifier on the ground, you don't necessarily have to worry about washing it off, right? Some of that exposure is, is good for your kid. Now, I guess it does depend on where it falls, right? So a little bit of logic applies. If you're in a bathroom, <laughs> right, somewhere where it's a highly trafficked, dirty area, like modern dirt, okay, maybe you rinse off the pacifier. If it falls in a kitty litter box, maybe rinse it off, right, maybe right, sterilize right. and bleach that thing. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, but, you know, in, in uh, response to your question, we, we have this need for training. And if the immune system doesn't have an opportunity to learn, well, this thing in the body, is this a good thing or a bad thing? And I use the analogy oftentimes of target practice. Mm -hmm. And this really maps on nicely to immunity and especially autoimmunity. Autoimmunity is when the immune system can't distinguish between is this friend or foe? And part of that's because it doesn't have adequate target practice. Mm -hmm. And so this is where the exposure to things are important. And this is why you see back to the farm animal study, the more exposure to animals, the better the target practice, the better the aim, the less we have this kind of bystander effect where you're accidentally shooting the things that you shouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, and because we have this very large density of immune cells in the gut, that's really one of the main ways through which the immune system samples the outside world. You do get some sampling from your skin and your lung, like all these different mucosal membranes, but because you're putting stuff, you know, in your body and some of that stuff needs to be absorbed and some of it needs to be kept out, this is arguably the most sensitive area for purveying what do we want to have in the system? What do we want to attack and keep out of the system? And that sets the tone for the rest of your life. And there's these really interesting 
um, I, I, receptors in the gut, you probably learned about this in the course. There's things like toll-like receptors or pattern recognition receptors. And that's just looking for you know, the, the surface of these microbes or food particles and learning what these truly, like what does the pattern of a piece of chicken look like as compared to a virus? And that's what helps the immune system say, ah, we're going to not touch that, we're going to shoot that. But when it breaks down, this is when you have someone who is reacting to all these foods, let's say. Like, I can't eat anything and I'm on six foods. It's like, well, part of this is the immune system has gone haywire. So we can help you expand your diet and have a calmer immune system if we get these things right. But, but to your question, a lot of this does trace back to things that happened earlier in life and the ability or the, the lack of the ability of the immune system to develop and be really well trained. Yeah. You know, I, I think it's interesting to contrast, like, like I've been to many third world countries where, you know, for example, like in the backwaters in Kerala, India, where you see people literally bathing and, you know, kids swimming and mothers doing the laundry in waters with like sewage pumping out into that river pretty nearby mm. and, you know, maybe funeral pyres and, and, and corpses and ashes and, you know, all kinds of animals and creatures right, right in there. And, and, you know, feces of humans and other creatures and, and they're literally bathing in it and swallowing bits of it and getting it in their na nasal, nasal passageways and right. ears. And, um, and then you contrast that to the way that, a lot of modern Westerners and particularly probably North Americans are when it comes to germs where, you know, you're living in these totally unnatural artificial environments with, you know, fake wood on our floors and, you know, everything sterilized and cleaned every day or every few days. Um, the difference in exposure to these germs, both the, the magnitude, like how many germs, as well as the diversity. I mean, it's got to be a thousand orders of magnitude difference <laughs> as far as what, what you're, what you're getting exposed to. Yeah, it, it's, it's very well said. And th there is a, I think an important point there, and this is something I did review in healthy, good, healthy you, because I was curious about this and you do see, we, we, we looked at data from Bangladesh where they had exposure, a much greater exposure to microbes and they had more diverse microbiota but the incidence of diarrheal illness was also much higher. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the observations that helped me make the distinguishment between what I call old dirt versus new dirt. And it's not an exact, um, you know, there's not an exact science to finding that, but just applying a little bit of logic to it. If it's something that you would have encountered as a free living hunter gatherer, we could term that loosely old dirt. And if it's something that is more of a modern advent, we could phrase that new dirt. And so what you're describing, I mean, those things are natural to some extent, but it's probably just the volume and the concentration that make them unnatural. Right. So that that's where, you know, there's a little bit of gray in the exposure. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not like a hunter gatherer tribe, maybe. Right. It isn't bathing in the runoff of a city and the sewage, you know, exactly. you know, so it, to some, some extent, animal feces, yeah, there's probably some animal feces and maybe a hunter gatherer peeing up the river from you, but yeah, the, the concentrations are probably orders of magnitude less in the hunter gatherer yeah. society. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So how does, how do probiotics fit into this picture and map on to this kind of this, this territory that you've, yeah. you've built out so far? Well, you know, this is one of the most, I think, frustrating areas that I've been watching as someone who prides myself on really staying abreast of what's being published in the probiotic literature. And I, I do think it's really important maybe just to start with one distinction here. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to choose my words carefully because um, I put myself in the shoes of the healthcare consumer as often as I can. And what I could see being very challenging is there's all these experts, right? up here talking about various things and they all seem to pay lip service to science right? the, the science says and the science but as someone who really knows the science in a couple areas certainly not every area but the areas where i do know the science really well you'll look at others who are making comments and you, you just see how 
sloppy and I think lazy some of the arguments are. You know, in fact, I recently did a YouTube video on antibiotics and there was a, a BBC reporter who wrote an article about why you should avoid probiotics if you're taking antibiotics. Right. And um, it's just, if I'm being honest, infuriating looking at how there was this one study, one study that found taking a probiotic after taking antibiotics delayed the time until which the microbiota returned to normal. Mm -hmm. Now, on its face, that may sound like a bad thing. But if you keep in mind that the microbiota measurements are still evolving and we're still trying to figure out, and you probably learned this in the course, I'm, I'm sure the, the professor or the teacher probably expressed some frustration at some of these direct-to-consumer microbiome tests that oh, yeah. really, yeah, they haven't validated that what they're saying actually means anything. And this is something I think consumers really struggle with. What do you mean? Like the, I bought this test and these are green, but those are red. So those are bad and these are good. It's like, well, yes, but the, the thing is, who is determining what's bad or good? Because mm -hmm. If they're like you biome that got shut down by the FDA for using in part dog poop to determine what the normative ranges were, oh my then gosh. when you're saying something's good or bad, you're doing that in part literally based upon dog feces. So how that maps onto a human obviously is, is a huge inferential stretch. So this study found that the microbiota may be delayed in returning to normal if taking antibiotics. And got all this press, right? The, the BBC reporter made sure that this was the, the primary person they reviewed as part of their investigative journalism, yet they ignore meta-analyses, which are summaries of clinical trials showing better clearance of whatever the infection that's being treated when co-administering probiotics alongside antibiotics and less antibiotic-associated side effects like diarrhea and abdominal pain. Mm -hmm. So what the BBC did in this case was they said it's more important to optimize for this one study based upon a somewhat speculative measure of the microbiota for turning to normal more quickly. That's more important than meta-analyses of clinical trials saying that you'll have less diarrhea and less side effects. So I just want to maybe start there with the framing that if people get contradictory opinions on this, yes, you, you will, but it's it's incredibly important the type of science you look at. If you get the highly publicized one study that was different and made good news, that's different than actually looking at what matters in terms of clinical outcome. Translation, you go this path. Well, John, congratulations, your microbiota looks better. But doc, I'm crapping my brains out <laughs> as, co as compared to, well, the microbiota ha hasn't returned to normal per se, but how do you feel, John? I feel great. I have no side effects. So that's kind of the delineation in terms of what data you choose could determine what path you end up on. Yeah. And th this is, this kind of overlaps with something we've talked about uh, on our, in some of our previous conversations. Um, and one of the things that I've always commented on that I really love about you and the way that you think and approach the scientific evidence that you know, to be, to be blunt, there's a lot of people, including many of our colleagues who just quite frankly, don't understand the hierarchy of scientific evidence right. and, and who are all too willing to latch on to one or two particular studies and ignore 10 others that say the opposite right. and then present those one or two to support their particular bias. Um, and, and many of that, that can sometimes be well-meaning and they're just, they just don't understand the, the hierarchy of scientific evidence and that, that it's not okay to do that. You have to look at the overall body of evidence and things like, as you said, systematic reviews and meta-analyses. Um, and sometimes it's, uh, it, it, ha it does have, you know, kind of ulterior motive. Somebody has a particular dietary dogma that they're sure. trying to promote and make money off of. And they are deliberately misrepresenting the body of evidence and cherry picking one or two studies and framing that as if that's representative of the evidence as a whole. Um, but yeah, anyway, this is, this is one thing I really love about you is just the commitment to yeah. the hierarchy of evidence and representing that evidence accurately. Thank you. And yeah. so with that in mind, when you do look at the evidence in this way, it becomes apparent that 
we can greatly simplify the approach to probiotics. Now, going back maybe seven years ago, I'll do about an hour of reading per night. I get sent every time there is a abstract published on a wide array of, of papers. I get sent the abstract and I kind of filter through those, read the ones that make sense, throw out the ones that don't. Now it's me plus two other researchers because it's just the, the body has grown. I think the work has grown. And so I get to review a brief now that's pre-filtered and there are many, many relevant studies being published on probiotics every week. And I'm always reading through these. And here's what the evolution of the probiotic science looked like kind of on the macro level. Going back seven-ish years, you'd see the first study that in a, in a rigorous kind of randomized control trial setup documented that probiotics can help with, let's say, constipation. That's just one of many different things that have been studied, but we'll just use a model of constipation. And wow, okay, great. This is, you know, I was very excited about this. I think most of us in kind of the natural health community were saying, awesome, here is a natural agent. So instead of having to go on a prescription laxative like Amatiza or Linzess, we can now look at this one study. And the company that made that probiotic wanted to broadcast that and that's totally fine and good right you you invested in a study it had a positive result you're totally justified in wanting to showcase that but three or six months later a, another study was published with a different probiotic also showing a benefit for constipation and now you come years and years later there have even been comparative trials that took one group of people all with constipation, one group got the one probiotic, another group got a different probiotic, and they both showed a similar benefit. The same thing has been shown with depression, with anxiety, with SIBO, because there's just so much literature now. However, there are still those who are making the claim that you need this specific formula for X condition or reductionist, um, you know, even further would be saying you need this specific strain. So with probiotics, species de designation and then strain, species a little, little bit broader, let's say lactobacillus, acidophilus, and then there may be three or four different strain designations of lactobacillus, acidophilus. Um, it's almost like saying you have, and this is a really crude analogy, but you have um, dogs and then you have different breeds of dogs, right? So the way I try to respond to this is, okay, well, if different formulas have all shown benefit, those different formulas have different species and they have different strains. So there's no need to get down to this very, very uber specific level of granular detail and say, you need this specific strain. And I'll, I'll tie it back to how this matters in a second. Now, this is getting a little bit deep. But when you look at the strains, and this is something that we've recently done, and we're hoping to publish this as, as a, like a narrative review by the end of the year. When you look at the different strains, you can trace them back to different pharmaceutical houses. And I'm not saying this means there's like the monopoly man behind this, oh, <laughs> trying to make money. But... It's, it's a logical outcome, which is you invest in doing research on a strain, and then you want to broadcast and showcase how helpful that strain is. But if there's three different companies who have patented and made three different strains, and they have all shown similar benefit, then when we're arguing back and forth over this strain versus that strain, this formula versus that formula, this is just a derivative of the influence that marketing pressures and industry influence has had on the body of science, not necessarily that you have to be this specific with your selection of probiotics. And when you realize that, you can step out of this, well, I've got depression, so I need this formula, but I also have constipation, so I need that formula. And you can just go crazy, whereas there's a really simple heuristic we can use to help people navigate how to find the right probiotic for their system. And we can unpack that in a moment, but let me, I guess, pause there for a second before we jump into that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, I will say the, the, the 
the gut course I just took with this, this professor, his name's Dr. Harlack, um, actually kind of emphasized the opposite. He, he has the opposite. He has the yeah. opposite opinion. Yeah. He, he emphasized that, uh, there, there is a ton of strain specificity and he spent like an hour presenting study after study showing that even within a given species of probiotic, there were massive differences in outcomes for specific, diff, uh, specific conditions. Now I'm sure I just interviewed him and, and we talked about this, uh, topic. I haven't released the podcast yet, but, um, you know, he did acknowledge, and I think this is where there's overlap between your, your views that, like, let's say within, I think he gave the example of, um, bifido, like, let's say all bifido bacteria species might all produce, uh, a, a particular short chain fatty acid, uh, propionate, let's say. And, um, it, it doesn't really matter what particular strain that you're getting. If, if the benefits for that particular function that you're, you're looking at are coming from the production of that, that specific short chain fatty acid and all bifido bacteria, uh, in general, or of this particular species, they all produce significant amounts of that. You're going to see benefits, but there are more, there are also more specific conditions. He would argue that, um, where, where even within a specific species of bacteria, a particular strain either showed a benefit or didn't. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm familiar with the argument. Um, gosh, where to, where to begin in addressing this? So I, I have asked to have a debate and it's not something that's, that's been, uh, received in, in terms of wanting to have this discussion and, you know, trying to be as, as tactful as I can, I, the, the burden of proof I think is on those who want to make the use of probiotics more complicated. And if I can produce evidence that shows positive outcomes, and I'm not talking about getting down into the, the granular detail, because this is how you can obfuscate, in my opinion, truth. Details can be the enemy of clarity. And if I throw enough details at you, I can confuse you into submission. And this is usually the arguments that are deployed by those that are trying to use that tactic. And I would argue, well, if I can take a group of free living people with IBS or depression and hit the outcome with no specificity regarding the strains, then you have to show me that you can get better outcomes with the specificity of strains. Mm -hmm. And I think this is most easily able to be seen when looking at meta analyses with a meta analysis, you will have different formulas used, mm -hmm. including different species and definitely different strains. So if a meta analysis of 18 clinical trials, let's say found that probiotics can resolve SIBO and they're using different species and different strains in a lot of those studies, yet the aggregate finding was still positive. That tells us that it doesn't really matter in terms of, you can pick one or two or three or four formulas, you know, of the one through four options. And those all seem to confer benefit. Mm -hmm. So I, I appreciate Harlick's work, but I think it's become less relevant, especially over the past five years when we were at an earlier point in time, that seven year ago, rough um, proxy I put out there when there was only a handful of studies showing certain outcomes, constipation, depression. That's where I think the, 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 the probiotic advisor sort of information really made the most sense. Mm -hmm. But my argument has been that now that we see, you know, again, these head to head comparison trials, looking at different formulas, showing the same benefits, it becomes very hard to justify that approach. Unless, again, unless you zoom down into the mechanism and that tends to obfuscate, you can paint a very attractive case when saying, well, this probiotic is antihistamine and these people have depression, therefore we should be using this probiotic. But I can turn and find new clinical trials that have shown an antihistamine effect in those with conjunctive rhinositis or atopic dermatitis. So like, we can do this like point counterpoint all day, but I guess the, the decision the consumer is confronted with is, do you want to have to do a course to determine 
you know, what probiotic you need or think about your probiotics like taking three different drugs. Well, this drug for depression, this drug for blood pressure, or the different paradigm is how can we use probiotics as effectively as possible to heal the gut and therefore intervene upstream, kind of like we were discussing earlier, where if you have good absorption and a healthy immune system, the downstream benefit is going to be multifold. Cognition, sleep, mood, joint, skin. And that's where we've targeted our intervention. You know, as someone who does research in the clinic and we have a clinical team and a research team, I feel very justified in the approach that we use because it's something that is helping patients and it's not something that's highly complicated in terms of it's a simple protocol. And that's, you know, that's, I think the, maybe the most important thing, which is with a higher degree of understanding, we should see clinical care become more simplified. Usually the more elaborate something is, there's a, lower or poor degree of understanding but with with a higher degree of mastery or understanding you get out of the the kind of incomprehensible level of details and you get to a simple protocol and and so that's that's kind of what i'm arguing for is this simplified protocol it doesn't have to be so uh specific okay as you were talking i was formulating something that we can take out of the realm of gut health and probiotics that I think is analogous to this, that I also think that probably you, neither you nor he would object to. Um, my, my background since I was a, a kid, and this might be true for you as well, was more in fitness and bodybuilding and athletic performance. And I, I think an appropriate analogy for what you're describing could be exercise in the sense that we could go find systematic reviews and meta-analyses on exercise, a category of exercise. And that might include everything from riding a stationary bike for an hour uh, and doing, or doing long duration, steady state endurance cardio activity to weight training, to high intensity interval training, to sprint interval training. Right. Totally different types of activity. Maybe one is a five minute workout that's all out intensity. Another is a two hour, you know, low intensity walking or, or light jog. Sure. Right. And we could find research looking at um, brain health and the incidence of neurodegenerative disease or cardiovascular disease. And we could say across all these different types of exercise, we see reductions in the incidence of neurodegenerative disease, cardiovascular disease, stroke, um, cancer, what, you know, diabetes, da, 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 da. And then right. based on that kind of analysis, we could then say, oh, it doesn't matter what type of exercise you're doing. Just do exercise because they all have similar reductions in those outcomes, which is true on that level. Yet it is also the case that if we looked at other specific outcomes, let's say, the amount of muscle building that takes place or strength gain that takes place or the translation into performance enhancement in the context of um, so playing soccer or basketball or something like that. We might see huge difference. In fact, we would see huge differences um, between different types of exercise as far as those specific outcomes, you know, in, in terms of the high intensity interval training type activity might translate way better into athletic performance enhancement in those kinds of high intensity sports. If somebody's goal is building muscle, then obviously weightlifting is going to be vastly superior to endurance activity. So anyway, that, that's my attempt to sort of reconcile maybe both, both of the way that you guys are thinking about this, this topic. Yeah, I, I appreciate the analogy. Um, I think Harlick and I have, we just have very different worldviews. Mm. I think he's, I think he's wrong in his hypothesis and we're going to publish a paper, like I said, within a year, but his, his argument does break down. Um, I also like your point and I appreciate your point. However, um, one of the things I noticed in exercise, I, I did a lot of training with the Czech Institute early in my career and they went through these very, very elaborate assessments. Mm -hmm. only to have very similar protocols that were used for all of the participants mm -hmm. with some nuance. So I take your point fully. There is some nuance, but the nuance, in my opinion, and I think this is the most tied in with what the evidence supports, if the evidence is not cherry picked, 
is the nuance is not within the probiotic um, per se. And uh, there is, you know, we use three different types of probiotics. We personalize those to the individual. But then from there, if they're not healing appropriately, we move on to other therapeutics. And this, I think, like to try to just cut to the bottom line, we want to be able to use probiotics within six to eight weeks to determine are they helping get their full benefit out of them and then move on to the next therapy. And if you're doting it for too long, I would argue you've gotten way past a level of detail that helps you perform any better as a clinician. Similar thing I would argue with exercise, right? If someone still has hip pain after two months on a protocol, you can keep modifying the protocol or you can say, well, maybe this type of support isn't helping the individual. Maybe we thought their hip flexors were too weak, but maybe they're too tight, or maybe this is a compensation due to the rib cage not expanding and therefore the pelvic floor being hypercontracted. So now we have to modify our approach. And this is where I think the the clinical experience really ties into this as a practicing clinician. I'm not sure if Harlick is, is seeing patients or not. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we want to we should be seeing a level of improvement with probiotics within a couple of weeks. There's mm -hmm. one or two modifications you can make. And then from there, you have to move on to the next thing. So I, I take your point and I think personalization is important, but there is a point at which the personalization gets so fastidious that it doesn't offer any additional benefit clinically. And I would argue mm -hmm. you kind of end up spinning your wheels. Yeah. Well, look, I'm, I'm my personal philosophy and approach to health is very much a generalist philosophy that I, I, I'm, a, I'm a big critic, as you know, of uh, what I think is a hyper focus on individualization and personalization that is often built on tests that aren't even yeah. accurate or clinically valid. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think I, I'm really kind of an advocate of the basics, the fact that 80 plus percent of the chronic disease burden are diseases of lifestyle. And most people are nowhere close to an optimal diet and lifestyle. Right. So I'm, you know, I'm a huge advocate of that. Whereas I think purely from a marketing perspective, there's so many functional medicine doctors and you're definitely not in this category, but there's so many functional medical medical doctors who have promoted this narrative that there is nothing universal about health and that everything needs to be hyper individualized to the person. And so anyway, I, I'm a big critic of that. And I think there's so much that is universal. And I would go so far as to say most people can fix almost all of their health problems based purely on optimizing their nutrition lifestyle using universal principles rather than individualized strategies. Yeah, I think that's well said. I think, I think another way we could state that would be we need macro medicine, mm -hmm. not micro medicine. So here would be an example. Someone comes in, their gut is not healthy, and they're having a number of symptoms that are a derivative of that. Well, there's a couple different ways you can go with diet, right? So the, I'm going to argue the macro, I, I think you know, the, the harlic is kind of the micro, the macro would be, okay, there is maybe two or three different diets that would work for you, right? We can go high carb, we can go low carb, we can modulate fiber and prebiotics. But beyond that, you can get you can get into such a uber level of detail where someone could be trying diets for a year. And we see this in the clinic, right? They've done low salicylate, then low oxalate, then low histamine, then low mm -hmm. lectin. And they come in and it's like diet is not the problem. Like you get a A plus triple gold star, right? Like <laughs> you've done every diet in the world and you've gotten a 10% yield. Maybe you didn't identify early enough that you've done as much as you can in the diet camp and now it's time for another therapy. So we go over to probiotics and we have them use a lactobacillus bifidobacterium blend combination plus a Saccharomyces boulardii plus a soil based. And we see what kind of response that gets us. If, if it's working, great, maybe we'll go to a higher dose, but that may only get you in some cases, let's say a 30% level of improvement. Now what we could do is say, well, we need a different soil based formula because we need a different strain with a different mechanism of action. And you do this for four months. And just like with diet, you probably get very little additional benefit. Whereas you could say, okay, we've gotten 10% out of diet in two months, right? We didn't do the year diet ridiculousness. We got another 20% or 30% of the probiotics after six weeks. Okay, so now we're at 30 or 40% total improvement. 
now let's do a gut reset with elemental diets or let's do herbal antimicrobial therapy and you work through the therapies again on the macro level and you're thinking about this decision tree with the patient right you're going from one to the other to the other and it's this cascading array of decisions that you run through this way you're getting patients improvement as quickly as you can and you're not floundering too long in any therapy because it does sound admittedly it does sound appealing and alluring when someone can give you this narrative of well you need this because specifically your system is is you know not producing enough this or that people love that idea of highly personalized medicine the problem is you end up being the guinea pig yeah. because if it's so personalized it's never been done before or it's only been done in a very speculative manner then you are the guinea pig and your clinician doesn't really have a lot of data to go upon whereas on the macro level we can construct for a person a roadmap and say we're going to have a high demand upon every therapy that therapy is either going to help or it's not going to help and if it's not helping we're moving down the path to the next item. This way we will navigate you to the end point of feeling well as quickly as possible. And we're not gonna spin our wheels in the micro level of theory or this highly, highly personalized approach that sounds really awesome, but doesn't tend to deliver. Yeah, well said, I like that. Um, I love everything you said there. So let's talk specifics on probiotics and let's get practical now. Um, I, as much as I would love to just continue the, the back and forth for another hour, I'm sure people yeah. listening want us to get like, okay, tell me what I should do, you yes. know? Yes. Um, so, so yeah. Yeah. let's say people are struggling with chronic fatigue. They're struggling with maybe gut issues. They notice a lot of gas and bloating and abdominal discomfort and they've got brain fog. They've got sleep issues, depression, anxiety, those kinds of things. Sure. Um, and they're, they're just listening to this thinking, what the heck? Just tell me what to do. What probiotics should I take? Yes. And this is what's nice about the simplified approach. Mm -hmm. We don't have to go to this uber level of detail. So when you do zoom out and look at the probiotic research, you see the vast majority of probiotic research uses one of three types of probiotics, either your traditional blend of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. This is your VSL3 or your VisBiome. This is your traditional type. And different studies will use different formulas some will have five species some will have eight some will have 15. but there's this clear general trend of a formula that's predominated by various lactobacillus and bifidobacterium species so this is your your one type we call it a category one lactobacillus bifidobacterium blend the other is saccharomyces boulardii this is actually a healthy fungus florastor is one of the bigger kind of uh, off the shelf probiotics that you'll see. And there's been a number of studies done with Floristore. A lot of research actually with helping to reduce either traveler's diarrhea or antibiotic associated side effects. So it's another type. And then the third, the soil based. This is the bacillus. There's various bacillus strains you'll see with the soil or spore forming probiotics that are also called bacillus lichenformis, bacillus clausii, bacillus subtilis. Some of the studies use one species, some use two, some use three, some use four, but they all show a similar benefit. So when we look at this on the macro level, it doesn't make a huge difference what specific formula you use because we know different formulas have been used and they've mostly shown benefit. So what we want to do is try to use the, the best, the broadest probiotic support that we can. Because remember, our goal isn't to use the probiotics to suppress a certain pathway. It's to help heal your gut as far upstream as possible. If we heal the gut, all these second order or downstream effects should follow. So here's how you apply these. If you're someone who's very sensitive and you've exhibited a history of being reactive, I would start these formulas one at a time. Because there is a possibility that one of these three will not sit well with you. So start one at a time, give yourself three or five days, and if it's tolerated, great, move on to the next one. If it's not tolerated, you want to identify, is this an adjustment reaction? And these usually roll on and roll off inside of a week. All right, two days in, you have some turbulence, you might feel a little backed up, you might feel a little bit headachey or flu-like, but that should come on and abate within a week. That's important because you don't want to jump ship too early, you don't want to 
be at day two and say, ooh, I feel a little bit turbulent and then stop because that might be actually a good thing. However, you don't want to be a month into a negative reaction and say, oh, I'm peeling this onion. Eventually, I'm going to get through the other side. Mm -hmm. Usually, that other side should be achieved at about a week. So if you're sensitive, start these one at a time. Give yourself up to a week to see it, if it's an adjustment reaction. And if the reaction goes away by a week, continue. If the reaction persists at a week, stop and attempt to work on all three. Or if you don't tolerate one, put that one aside and then use the other two. Now, if you're not sensitive historically, then start on all three at once. And what this essentially does is this is kind of like a super probiotic in the sense that you're now using all three categories together. And we see this in so much of the antibiotic research. For H. pylori, there's triple or quadruple therapy, meaning at least two antibiotics. For SIBO, oftentimes two antibiotics are used. Um, and this is because having a diverse array of whatever therapy you're using tends to have a better effect. Part of this might be due to the pattern recognition receptors and the TOLAC receptors tuning the immune system. We also know that probiotics are anti-inflammatory, they're anti-dysbiotic, they're anti-SIBO. So just like anything else, if you have, let's say, six species, or you can have 20 species, you probably will have a better effect with the broader stimulus. And this is almost akin to replicating an environment that's very rich in bacteria. And there is also a trend that a multi-species formula in probiotics tends to work better than let's say a single or a double species formula. So we're just taking that same concept and we're broadening it out to use kind of this, this super probiotic, again, borrowing from so many other observations in medicine that this broader stimulus tends to work better than more of a narrow stimulus. Mm -hmm. And then you ride the wave. You wanna see where you plateau. There was recently a study that found the length of time on a probiotic did make a difference in terms of the peak outcome someone hit. Now, that's not to say three years, but you want to think of this, in my opinion, in month intervals. Go on for a month, do a look back. How do I feel? Continue for another month, do a look back. How do I feel? At some point, you will plateau. Once you've plateaued, then I would stay there for a month or two just to make sure your new plateau is consistent because things tend to change, right? You've probably had one week is better than another. And especially if you're looking at one day versus another day, there's a lot of variability there. But if you go more, again, more macro and you do a month look back, you'll be able to determine, okay, I have less food reactivity than I've had in a long time. That's been persistent. I'm also sleeping better. My skin is also more clear. It's been getting better and better and better. Now it seems to have plateaued and now I feel stable. And once you've hit that stable point, I like to aim for at least two months, then work down to find the minimal effective dose. And for some people, they come off of a probiotic, they never look back. For other people, they notice, I'm not as good as I was, but I'll use myself as an example. If I'm not on probiotics and I eat out, and have a glass of wine, I'll feel a little bit. Won't be anything crazy, right? But you'll have a looser bowel, you'll have a little bit of bloating. Whereas when I'm on a probiotic, I don't exhibit any of that. So you want to look for those, in, in some cases, more subtle tells and work to find the minimal effective dose that works for you. Mm -hmm. And this, this can allow one within a few months to really go through a probiotic protocol extract as much benefit out of it as possible and not get you know too caught up in, in floundering with this whole array of, of different formulas um, because the, the, the again the, the challenge with all the different formulas is people tend to exhibit multiple symptoms mm -hmm. so if you're saying that you're going to use a probiotic for one specific symptom or one specific mechanism find me a person who only has one symptom most people have multiple symptoms and this is because problems in the gut like we talked about earlier can lead to a number of downstream symptoms so i think another reason why we don't want to get into micromanaging the probiotics but rather let's give the gut this really comprehensive support of the three different formulas 
go through that kind of clinical application that I outlined. And that works really well for a lot of people. Nice. Great explanation. Um, can you talk briefly on the sort of the, the, the three mechanisms? I know this, there's, there's many, but um, mechanisms behind the bifido and lacto, what sort of generally what those are doing in the gut and to health more broadly versus the bacillus, the spore-based and the, right. and the saccharomyces boulardii. And then also I remember um, I'm spacing on who I had this conversation with, but after a podcast that, that you and I did previously um, and you were talking quite a bit about saccharomyces boulardii, uh, I mentioned it to one person, maybe it was Grace Liu, I forget who it was, but they kind of poo-pooed Saccharomyces boulardii and said, oh, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't do anything. And anyway, I'm, I don't, I don't know if that, that is representative of such some broader sort of controversy about that particular probiotic. I know that I personally have seen quite a, a lot of positive research around it, but I'm just curious if you could speak to maybe why some people are negative about it. Well, again, I think it depends on your frame of analysis, right? And to be totally transparent, I don't spend much time looking at the mechanism because I don't care. What mm -hmm. I care about is you have diarrhea, you have depression, you have brain fog, you have joint pain, you have insomnia. Let's make sure we can fix those things. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> there is so much literature being published. It is challenging just to keep pace with the clinical trials. Yeah. If it, so, and that's why I think I may have a different approach because those probiotic research briefs. And by the way, we do a podcast per month just on probiotic research updates that people ever wanted to tune in. Nice. Um, so I'm looking at this through the frame of your Ari, you have symptoms, right? We're going to essentially do a clinical trial. If you were a patient in the clinic, we are doing a clinical trial. You come in with a number of symptoms. We're trying to treat those symptoms. And this is one of the things we, we use as kind of a, a guiding principle at the clinic. We treat people not labs. So over the years, I've gotten less interested in the mechanisms because the thinking there keeps changing, mm -hmm. right? It's kind of trying to pin the tail on the wrong end of the donkey. It used to be, we need more prebiotics and short chain fatty acids, something that Grace Lou was a huge proponent of. And I was over there saying, have you seen in the uh, IBS and IBD literature that a higher intake of prebiotics tends to flare those people? increase inflammation and make them feel worse. But I was looking at the clinical trials and I think she was looking more so at the mechanism of healthy bacteria in the gut produce things like short chain fatty acids. These feed the enterocytes. These help to close the actin myosin tight bridging in the lining of the gut. Therefore less leaky gut sounds cool, except <laughs> you're not looking at this in a Petri dish or a mechanism. You're looking at this in a human being who has a problem and what happens when we give that human being, let's say with IBS, a high dose of prebiotics. Turns out when it feeds those uh, bacteria and it produces more short chain fatty acids, that pisses off the immune system and there's an inflammatory response and leaky gut gets worse. So um, the underlying mechanism has become much less interesting to me because this is how I think one gets led into treating people like lab values and not treating people for, we want to make you as healthy as possible and reduce your symptoms. Mm -hmm. What you said about prebiotics is interesting. I'm curious how much you would generalize that because one of the things that, that, that I saw a lot of research on in this, in this gut course I've been taking the last few months is sort of the specificity of specific probiotics and that even in the context of Sorry, SIBO probiotics or, or prebiotics, uh, pre prebiotics okay. um, in the sense that, you know, people who might react, like, let's say in the context of SIBO, people who might react to certain kinds of fiber where there is a tendency among a lot of clinicians, I think, to think, oh, well, let's get rid of fiber, you know, more the move towards the elemental diet, low fiber diets. Um, there's actually quite a lot of positive research around the intake of specific prebiotics as being highly beneficial in that context, as well as IBS. Um, do you have any, any thoughts on sort of specificity of prebiotics? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, and I use that as a, that, uh, example of prebiotics being problematic as a good example of why we have to be careful about 
making a speculation from mechanism and broadening that out to clinical intervention. Mm -hmm. And I also discussed this in Healthy Good, Healthy You. There is evidence showing that a higher fiber diet can produce benefit. There is evidence showing that prebiotic supplementation can help those with IBS and with IBD. But the incidence of adverse events is higher than it is with a probiotic intervention. Mm -hmm. So when I look at this, again, on the meta level, both of these tools can work, right? And there are some people for whom they do better on a higher fiber, higher prebiotic, which is why I mentioned the vegetarian diet earlier, right? For some people that works well, it's a smaller subset. Um, so yes, these things have a time and a place. The clinical benefit is better for probiotics than it is for prebiotics. And the incidence of adverse events is lower, mm -hmm. but it's not to paint with the absolute brush and say, never, I tend to, and we at the clinic tend to start with a lower FODMAP probiotic sort of starting point because that seems to produce more consistent results with a lower incidence of adverse events. There was some excitement around certain prebiotics, like Bimuno was one that was purported to have a lower incidence of, of side effects. I wasn't really impressed after using Bimuno in, in the clinic for a few months. I wasn't really impressed with the outcomes there. It didn't seem to move the needle enough clinically to be any better than the other tools that we were using. Uh, but, you know, I hear that case and I, I see that argument. And also with fiber, certainly soluble versus insoluble fiber. Um, and there's a, there was another fiber made that I'm blanking on the name. It was purported to be better for patients with SIBO. I used it for a little while but it didn't seem to have a clinical signal that was more beneficial when comparing it to the other therapies. So mm -hmm. open on those things. And there are definitely some for whom these things work, uh, to, to a, you know, notable degree. I think the cohort there that does the best are those that are more prone toward constipation. That cohort with fiber and prebiotic intake, I think you can make the, the strongest argument. But, um, again, with the, tinkering that I've done with various prebiotics and fibers. Yes, there's some benefit, but for us, when, you know, on the macro level, looking at all these therapies, the fiber and prebiotics are more of a mid-level intervention. They're not a great starting point. Cause remember, I'm thinking about all of this and not in terms of the one thing or the other thing, but how do we put this into a clinical model that's built around the person's data mm -hmm. and looking at this in terms of how often does a therapy produce benefit as compared to how often does it cause some sort of harm or adverse event? And with the fiber and prebiotic interventions can be helpful, but if you can get some traction in the gut first by let's say using a low FODMAP diet or using probiotics, that tends to make some of the disease activity a little bit more quiescent. And then you have a higher likelihood of benefit and a lower likelihood of adverse events if you then use something like a prebiotic or a fiber. So for mm -hmm. us, it tends to be more of a mid-level intervention, but something that I do think has a time and a place. Yeah. Um, I have a, just a couple more questions for you. What, what do you think of the possibility, like the possibility of benefits with certain low fiber interventions initially? Um, let's say a low FODMAP or maybe in, I know an elemental diet's meant to be done short term. So maybe we'll leave that one out, but sure. um, like a lot of people are adopting carnivore diets now and noticing, um, Oh, you know, all my GI distress, my abdominal pain, my bloating, it's all gone. The, I've, I've discovered the best diet ever. This is the way I should eat forever. This is the optimal human diet. Um, and then a lot of those people, uh, I've seen experiment experience problems down the line, and then they become hypersensitive to plant foods when they try to reintroduce them. Sure. Um, what, what do you think of the potential harms of low fiber, uh, type diets done long-term? Yeah, fully, fully agree. And this is one of the things that as much as I've found myself arguing against prebiotics and fiber, because there was such a tailwind of, microbiota and enthusiasm for just feeding the, the gut bugs. It's not, um, it's not to say there's, there's not a middle ground and carnivore, you know, I find myself on the other side of the <laughs> trying to pull us back more to center in that sure carnivore 
as maybe a upfront elimination diet, shorter term. Okay. Beyond that, no, I don't think it's a diet that's justifiable long term. And my suspicion is these people are, are essentially eating around problems that they have and they need to heal their gut so that they have improved food tolerance. And this is a subset of patients that we see at the clinic who went carnivore. It worked well for them, but now their hair is falling out. They're not sleeping well. They're tired all the time, what have you. And it's probably because they've, they've tried to overly leverage the diet tool. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I learned this myself, right? I, I was on, I was doing all the stuff, right? I was paleo, paleo autoimmune, all organic. I thought maybe it was stress. So I was burning sage and meditating before I ate. I mean, I was doing all the stuff and I was still having reactivity. And then I learned, oh, I had this active issue in the gut. And until I started using some of the tools to heal my gut, diet would only get me so far. So carnivore, I, I see very uh, similar in terms of, yes, it will reduce symptoms. Um, and I'm also appreciative of how the carnivore movement has helped people to understand that, you know, meat and animal foods aren't bad, like they've been vilified. So I think there's some good there, but in terms of a long-term diet, no. And also in, in terms of what do those people need to consider other tools that can help them heal their gut so that they can get to a broader diet. And that's, that's one of the most important things I would like to see a patient get to is mid phase. We're really broadening out their diet and minimizing the number of supplements that they use. And they can determine what diet they want to go to. If they want to skew a little bit more in an animal based direction, fine. If they want to skew a little bit more in a plant, fine. But we'll at least try to get you to a point where you have the, the gastrointestinal resiliency so as to be able to thrive on whatever diet is that you want to be on. Okay. Um, last question for you, and then, I'll, and then I want to wrap up. Thank you for going overtime with me. I appreciate it. It's, yeah, it's always fun. Fascinating. Um, colonization. What are your thoughts on... Uh, colonization of different species of, of probiotic. This is, I mean, this is something that I think the general public often thinks, oh, I take a probiotic and it just goes in and it starts seeding everything. And the, those bacteria start multiplying. And uh, six weeks later, my gut is filled with those, all those bugs. Sure. Right. Sure. And this is something I've slightly shifted my opinion on over the past, maybe three years or so. Most probiotics don't colonize you, but some do. Mm -hmm. The exact uh, breakdown, I don't know if this has been determined or if it, if it has been determined, I haven't seen it. It is generally a misnomer to think that whatever you take in terms of a probiotic, it will colonize you. But there is some evidence showing a degree of colonization with some probiotics. The other thing here that is still unclear is the impact on the small intestine. Because a lot of this research is predominated by stool samples which tell you about what's going on in the colon. Mm -hmm. But that large density of immune cells that we talked about, that's mainly in the small intestine. The small intestine is where 90% of caloric absorption occurs, where most nutrients are absorbed. It's the most thin, kind of sensitive, permeable membrane. So it's also most prone to leaky gut. And this is where the impact of probiotics is really in its nascency because it's so hard to assess what's going on in the small intestine. You, you can't get a poop sample. You know, you can do a breath test, but that's, that's limited in, in what it tells you. So really to a you know, fair degree right now, we're limited in terms of what we can learn about the small intestine through biopsy, which means you have to have a nose or, or nasal gastric tube put down or through the throat and a sample taken from the small intestine directly. So it's a very invasive sampling procedure. And because of that, it's much harder to know. I suspect that there is a degree of colonization that occurs in the small intestine. But more importantly, these probiotics tend to have a transient benefit. So they, they secrete antimicrobial peptides, which is probably why they help with fungus, with SIBO, with parasites. They 
trigger some of these receptors that help to attune the immune system, which is why they help with leaky gut and with reducing inflammation. So more of a transient benefit. Now that transient benefit may perpetuate long term. If there was an imbalance and the probiotics rectified the imbalance, then once you stop taking the probiotics and the imbalance is now rectified, you can maintain that improvement going forward. But for some people, they do better on a lower dose long term. And that's probably because most of the benefit, not necessarily all, but most seems to be transient in nature. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Okay. Um, last thing is if you were going to tell like, like that scenario that I presented earlier, somebody has got all these different symptoms, chronic fatigue and brain fog and depression, anxiety, gut issues. Um, if you were going to sort of leave them with three bits of advice, what would those three things be? And then, uh, and then where do you, where would you like to direct people as far as any resources that, that you have to offer? Well, I think it's important to think through your healthcare again on the macro level. It's really easy to get pulled into a test, making all these promises and tying a, a pathway or a mechanism back to your symptoms and thinking, Ooh, I just need this, this one test or this one new, whether it's butyrate or whatever the new thing is, there's always something very alluring about a promise of this thing. You could take all those little things and consider them as part of this larger roadmap that is your healthcare picture. And that's the way you should be thinking through these things. And, and why this is important is it prevents you from floundering and spinning your wheels with any one thing for too long. A good clinician or a good healthcare process, they'll constantly be moving you forward, right? And, and you should have this expectation that within two to six weeks, I'm either improving and we're continuing or I'm not improving and we're modifying. Uh, so I think that's really important just to keep in mind because you know, if you spend, if you spend six months on a diet and you're trying to go through three diets, that's a year and a half, right? Mm -hmm. But if you spend six weeks and you're going through three diets, that's three months. So compound that by diets and then a, a number of different therapies, you can get in and out into your goal in a handful of months, or it can take you a handful of years, not to mention the expense that goes along with this. So have a high demand of your healthcare provider or the approach. I mean, I don't mean demanding like, you know, come in there like frustrated, but um, you, <laughs> you know, better get me results yeah. right now. <laughs> in like in a tactful and supportive way, you should be looking for th this high demand upon having improvements or at least feeling like, okay, we ran the experiment, it didn't work. And now we're modifying to the next thing and not a feeling like you're just floundering and spinning your wheels. Um, so I think that would be, you know, one of the more important things also within that, be careful not to get too zoomed in on any one thing. Um, SIBO would be a good example. Every time I see something from a Facebook group on SIBO, I just want to pull my hair out because you know, people make everything that's happening in their healthcare picture centered around SIBO. Yeah. And again, you want to have this kind of macro view on things because who knows this person could have SIBO and they could have undiagnosed sleep apnea and they could flounder with the SIBO for five years. And then a clinician says, Oh, like you may have sleep apnea. They do a test and then they get treatment for the sleep apnea, which by the way, there are some non-invasive, very simple therapies for sleep apnea that can work phenomenally well. Just as a quick aside, but the point I'm making is, again, be careful, this kind of reoccurring theme, not to get too zoomed into the micro. Um, so yeah, I guess that would be a couple of remarks. And then in terms of resources, my book, Healthy Good Healthy You, was my attempt to give everyone um, as much as I could put into a personalized guide. So that's one option. And then the clinic is also there in case people need help. And yeah, you know, we're always more than happy to help people through their healthcare journey, which I get, it can be challenging. I was there, I floundered for a while and it's great now to be able to help people get to improvement as quickly as possible and kind of take them through this macro medicine where we build out a plan for you 
based upon the best evidence in the macro level, not mechanism, not speculation. And we, we have, as I mentioned earlier, this high standard where we're going to build out a plan for an individual and we're going to move them through the plan. And we're expecting, like, we want to see you improve. And if we're not, we're going to pivot, we're going to modify so that we get you momentum and perpetuate that, me- that momentum as quickly as we can. Beautiful. My friend, it is always a pleasure to connect with you and have these conversations. Uh, I always really, really enjoy it and and get a lot of value from it. I know our listeners got a ton of value from this. So thank you so much for coming on the show again. And uh, I look forward to the next one. You know, I'm sure since you're always staying abreast of the latest research that's coming out on probiotics, we'll do another one in six months or so. And I'm sure you got more more new stuff to share. Let's do it. I think between now and then we should have two papers published, which I'm really excited about a gut thyroid case series and then another paper in the journal nutrients. Um, so yeah, I think we'll hopefully have some cool science to geek out on. Awesome, man. Well, it was a pleasure and uh, I look forward to the next one and uh, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with my audience. Same here. Thank you. Hey there, this is Ari again. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, if you found it valuable, please share it with your friends, share it with your family, help me get the word out there. Also, if you're on YouTube, make sure to hit the subscribe button and hit that little bell to get notifications every time we release a new video or new episode of the podcast. And if you're listening to this, make sure to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or on your favorite podcast. Thanks so much for supporting my work at the Energy Blueprint. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I will see you in the next one.